what holds people back from getting the careers that they really want. Often it's themselves. I'm not good enough. There isn't people like me there. I'm not necessarily going to fit in. It really is what you can see. You can't be something unless you can imagine it. I would talk a lot about the differences between men and women. There's a huge literature in behavioral science that covers risk aversion, competitiveness, negotiation. It's not as simple as a woman just taking on the men traits because they tend to be backlash for women when they do. What stops women from getting those senior leadership positions. Motherhood penalty is alive and kicking. We can't discount that women are treated differently. The belief around what maternity means drives these gender gaps to a greater extent than the actions of the woman herself. That's why who are in the senior positions becomes really important. In the absence of having a woman in a senior position, we want to have inclusive leaders. So how can we do that? So really paying attention Quick question, when did you discover that you're a leader, that your actions matter to those that look up to you? You may be an entrepreneur or an aspiring entrepreneur, innovating to change the world, or a CEO navigating a crisis, or a parent returning to work and learning to lead your career, your team, your children. There are many faces of leadership, and this is the podcast to explore them all. Welcome to Anatomy of a Leader with me, Maria Vorostovsky. I'm a headhunter and founder of HVO Search, where I help ambitious leaders hire their executive teams. My job today on this show is to help you discover your superpowers, to help you avoid making some of the same mistakes, and to remind you that even if you do, perfection doesn't and shouldn't exist. Thank you so much for listening and please do subscribe and follow this podcast because it really helps others to discover these incredible stories. This show will challenge the way you think and may even change your life. Grace, so wonderful to have you on the show. Thank you so much for coming. No worries. It's been a while setting it up. So I'm really, really yes. pleased to be here. Yes. No, I'm so excited to speak with you. I've got your book which is called um, Think Big and Take Small Steps and Build the Future That You Want, which I've read cover to cover and have so many questions that I had to edit myself <laughs> to make sure that we really fit in the most essential ones into the show. So, um, so thank you so much. No worries. I'm really excited for the interview. Great. Well, starting with the book, which I find super interesting because, you know, having studied psychology myself and gone down the route of, you know, understanding some sort of behavior science principles, to have you sitting here and to, you know, be able to ask you those questions. I'm, I'm very excited for that. So my first one is more about the book as to who is it for and why did you decide to write it? So I think the book is for anybody who wants to change their career. So it could be someone who's really fed up with the job that they're in and is looking for something new. It could be somebody who's plateaued in their career and they don't know why and they want to accelerate again. It could be for somebody who's coming to the end of their career. Perhaps they're coming to retirement and are thinking about what they're actually going to do next. And, you know, when I um, came to London initially, I used to get invited a lot to speak in corporate companies, particularly in banks, um, about women and women's progression within the industry. And I would talk a lot about the differences between men and women. So there's a huge literature in behavioral science that covers risk aversion, competitiveness, negotiation. And then I would talk about the fact that it's not as simple as a woman just taking on the men traits, not that they should want to do that anyway, but it's not as simple as they're adopting them because they tend to be backlash for women when they do. And then I would talk about what we can do about it my solutions were all firm-based. So I used to talk about what you could do at recruitment, which I know that you might be interested in, what you can do during the growth cycle, what managers can do, but never what the individual could do. And, you know, when you give these talks, even though the auditorium is full, very often they come from one point to the career cycle and that's individuals at the beginning of their career cycle. They're showing up to network, they're showing up to learn something new. And uh, people you say to me, both by putting up their hand, but also afterwards they would say, I really enjoyed the talk, but actually you really depress me because there's nothing that I can do myself. So you point out all these problems between men and women. I'm a woman in financial services and I have no clue about what to do except talk to the HRC, the CEO. And I mean, will that really work? And I think the answer to that is probably no. For most people, when they go and talk to the CEO and HR, they might listen to them, but then they move on to the next thing. 
So Think Big was really born for anybody, and particularly with these people in mind, who mightn't be able to control a lot about their careers, but they can control something. So in it really is getting real about what you can control, what's outside your control, and what you can actually do to navigate situations like bias and other people's dislike of you if it's holding you back in your career. So really aiming it at the individual individual, and in a response actually to, I won't call it a criticism because it was never said negatively, but this strong feedback that I was getting actually just looking at the firm and looking at firm level policies wasn't good enough. Anything from your background specifically that led you down this path of, you know, doing a PhD, going down this behavior science, you know, doing what you're doing now? No, not really. I mean, I, I will say, and I, I say this in the thing big, I, I think we should all have goals that we aim for that are far off in the future. Mm-hmm. But I think we need to be open to opportunities as we navigate along. And, and in my career, I've been always very much open to opportunities. You know, I, my, my background is in economics and computer science, so very different to where I'm sitting now. So I really empathize with people who want to shift career. I think the consistency in my career has been two things. One, wanting to measure things that are hard. So things like happiness, quality of life, success. And two, wanting to figure out what levers you can actually pull to get more happiness, to get more quality of life and and to get more success. But other than that, I've moved quite far away from where I was. So I didn't I, I didn't have these this linear path. And actually, if I were to go back and have a linear path, I don't think it would have been as enjoyable. I really embrace the fact that, you know, in five years time, I could be doing something completely different. Mm. I'd love to explore that because one of the things that you talk about is how do people fall into the careers that they, you know, fall into. Yeah. But before we do that, I'd like to just give our listeners and our, you know, people who are watching our audience more of an understanding of behavioral science. Like what is it and why should we care? So I think if you came to LSC to study behavioral science, um, one of the first lessons you'd learn is about two different thinking styles. So in economics, we believe that people make decisions and they weigh up the costs, benefits and risk. Mm -hmm. In behavioral science, we throw that out the window and we say, actually, there's two thinking styles. One is very, very fast. You're on autopilot. You're not necessarily paying attention to what you do. You're making decisions. They're very, very snappy. It's good because it speeds you up, but you're very much prone to error. And the second is very, very slow and very, very deliberate. So you really, really kind of big cognitive load, like what you would do if you were choosing a mortgage, for example, or choosing whether or not to go to a next job, still prone to errors. Um, and I think the first interesting part is that we spent about 80% of our waking time in the system one habit driven mode. So it becomes really important then to figure out what's happening to you when you're on autopilot, because your autopilot is determined by your upbringing, um, what happened to you in your teenage years, what happened to you in your early adult years, all the way up to whatever age you happen to be when you're listening to this podcast. And if you're not co- if you're not kind of paying attention and really self-reflective of what happens when you're in that mode, you tend to get dragged around like a plastic bag with your autopilot. It, it, it will do things for you anyway. And, and I think, you know, a lot of people in careers today, um, when they're kind of 30, 40, are sitting there saying, oh my God, how, how did I end up here? A lot of people who are in university today are sitting in their degree saying, oh my God, how did I end up choosing the subject? I, I don't identify with it at all. And, and I guess I think the lessons in behavioral science, and this is what I try to do in writing Think Big, that the lessons in behavioral science can not only point out where you might be most likely to make these errors when you're on autopilot and habit driven mode, but also has really good information about how we can put structures around ourselves to make sure we don't fall into those pitfalls and actually reprogram that autopilot mode, which is very, um, very, very possible with some endurance. Mm. I'm so interested in that ability to kind of self-reflect and understand why you do the things that you do yeah. and then sort of take stock and, you know, actually take the things that you can control into your control and move forward, especially when it comes to your career, because you're right. I mean, so many people kind of fall into it and then, you know, one thing after another promotion or yeah. moving sideways and you come to a place when you're like, what am I doing? Why am I here? But taking that back, I mean, do you have any insights as to how people end up in the jobs that they end up? I mean, anything that you know, you know, why do people decide to take up certain careers and others don't? 
So it really is what you can see. So, you know, it's it's funny. So the, if you if you ever are around people who believe in manifesting and you're around somebody else who doesn't, they really kind of think about this as kind of woohoo stuff that doesn't make any sense. But something that underlies manifesting is very, very true. You can't be something unless you can imagine it, right? So, and I think really, again, for people reading Think Big, I try to do two things. One, get people to really do this blue sky thinking where they imagine being and doing something that they never thought that they could do and they throw away all their constraints and two are always staying open to these other opportunities that are coming in oh, your way bearing in mind that we're our 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 imagination and our perception is always changing as we navigate life so as we navigate kind of new corridors we start seeing um we start seeing new things so if you go if you think take children for example it's no surprise that children will end up most likely choosing a job that's close to their parents or their peers, who, what, what's in their circles. So that's why exposure to lots of jobs um, when kids are young is a really great way to make sure that they're actually making informed choices because otherwise, you know, it's, a, it's hugely complicated and, and, and uncertain to think about not only what label of a job do I like, but will I, will I fundamentally really like their tasks? The second thing is people will always say, well, I got lucky and I fell into something. But very often, if you sit them down and you ask them to trace back where this luck actually came from, you'll realize it came from somebody who was in their networks, perhaps really at the edges of their networks, who told about them what an opportunity arise. They mightn't have seen them for one or two years and they come up out of the blue and say, you know, there's someone I would need to introduce you to. They need somebody to do X. And I think those two things combined, what I can actually see in my periphery, my peers, um, what they're telling me in school and my parents, and then also the networks that I'm building as I go through life, who might put me up for opportunities, they can ex they can explain a lot of the variation in what we actually choose to do. So if you put that together, if you're somebody who doesn't have a clue what to do, you need to one, get more information about careers. And now compared to in 1980, for example, there's loads of information on the internet. It's, it's very easy to figure out what entire careers can do. Loads of people do day in their life type type diaries. And two, really expanding your network and asking them questions about what jobs that they would think would suit you. Those two things really help people get a clear idea about what it is might suit them. Mm. I'm thinking about this because my sister is currently looking for jobs. Is, is yeah, I know. She's really cool. Yes. And so, you know, how do you advise a young person what to, what process to follow to figure out where they should be? Because as you said, you know, trying to expose yourself to quite a lot of things. I mean, yeah. it's like you don't know what you don't know either. So any any tips? So there's two things. So and and, and there's exercises in the book for people to go through with, with this. So mm -hmm. focus on activities and focus on skills. So ask yourself, what are the things that I enjoy doing daily? Um, and then ask yourself on skills what are the skills that I have now, for example? And then once you've done that about self-reflection, two things will come up. The activities will guide you on the type of job that you'd probably enjoy. And I think this is really fundamentally important that a lot of times we aim for jobs because of income or status. And, you know, don't get me wrong, people need a certain amount of income to live. And, and I have nothing against somebody who's motivated by income, but equally they should be paying attention to the tasks that will allow them to earn that income because it's very hard to be in a job where you hate the tasks that are day to day. Once you know the tasks that you want to do or the activities that you want to do, really getting real about the skills that you have now and those ones that you want to acquire. And I think for somebody navigating huge amounts of uncertainty, I'm not really pro people signing up for long degree courses, which is unfortunate because I work in a university, so not the best salesperson. But I think use the internet, use the free courses that are available in order to figure out if something is for you before you invest in something that's really, really expensive. Mm. And again, I think those two things, throwing away job lab labels, focusing on activities and then getting read about the skills is going to give you a, a good shot of getting you um, a job actually that you will enjoy. And say you do know what you want, but there are some obstacles in the way. I mean, what holds people back from getting the careers that they really want? Well, I think often it's themselves. So kind of the stories that we tell ourselves, I'm not good enough. There isn't people like me there. I'm not necessarily going to fit in. They really do hold us back. And, you know, I have a lot of empathy for this. I, I studied computer science and there was very, very few women who were there. When I took my first job in computer science, I was the only woman who was in the team. 
um, I think I was at an advantage compared to a lot of women now because people didn't keep pointing out that I was the only woman in the team. So I didn't internalize the fact that I was an oddity, which I think happens a lot now, a lot now in in in, in work environments. Um, but fundamentally, not seeing yourself in a job can hold you back. And I think you have to challenge that narrative and you have to say, OK, well, I don't see somebody like me. So that means actually I'm probably going to be able to add much more value. If there's a bunch of people who are thinking the same inside in a job, which, you know, let's think of a really important job like programming, where you're programming software that's really going to change the lives of consumers that you put it out to. If it's just a bunch of men of the same age who are doing that, their imagination is going to be quite limited, right? The more diverse people around, the better. So changing the narratives to say, actually, I belong there more than them, actually, because I bring this diverse perspective. For me and for lots of other people, it's time. So people think that they're time poor, which again, I think is a fallacy. If you audit how you're spending your week and you audit how you're actually spending your days, it can be quite an eye opener about how much um, time that we actually waste. Mm. So again, you know, if if you listen to this and you think, well, I would love a new job, but I just really don't have time, really challenging yourself on that. Um, People often use income as a as a reason. You know, I I really can't afford to lose income. Well, firstly, no one's saying that you're going to for, for um you're going to lose income. But secondly, I think it's important you know to realise that people are made redundant from jobs they hate every single day. So you can fail at something that you hate, just like you can fail at something that you love. So it's really important that you get real with yourself that life is short and you put yourself out there. So I think the first step, if somebody is sitting in a a, a job and they really dislike it. It's probably because they have these buggy narratives that they need to resolve themselves. And and some people like to go to battle with their narratives and give themselves a different story. And, and Mo Goddard, whose stuff that I love, recommends that. For me, I prefer something more tangible. So the time mode, it works really well. My my mind says, well, Grace, you just don't have time to take that on. And then I say, okay, let's do a time mode. And I see all of the ways in which I waste time during the week. And now I face into another week with kind of this new motivation to make sure that doesn't happen again. You call them time sinkers, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I really like that because I've been on a mission to figure out what I do day to day. And I use my calendar and I block my calendar with the things that I'm going to do. But no matter what, I always overbook myself. Yeah. There's just so much stuff in there. There's just absolutely no way I can go through any of those things in any given day. And that just makes me feel very frustrated. And end of the day, I just constantly feel like I'm failing and losing because it's just, yeah, it's just too many things. Any tips for me? <laughs> well, I think the first thing is you should block time for yourself to to decompress, right? So in some ways, if you're not feeling all right, then I'm, I'm not surprised that you, at the end of the day, when you don't achieve things, that you're basically feeling, okay, everything everything has kind of gotten on top of me. So I think the starting point on, on a, a Sunday or a month or whatever it is you book out is you're booking time for yourself to absolutely catch up. And I do this in the mornings quite a lot. And, and sometimes I will call colleagues in the morning, but I never book anything. So it's very hard for people to actually get me because I that's when I do my deep work, basically in the early mornings and, and, and late at night. And I think the second is maybe you're doing too much in the day, you know, so I think it's much more empowering to wake up and say, there are two things that I want to do today. And those are the two things that I'm going to knock out of the park with the time that's left. I'll do some other things, but at come nine o'clock tonight, I'm going to be happy if these two things are done. Mm. And then you get to the end of your day thinking, actually, wow, I really nailed it. I, I, I had some time for like self-care. I had some time to do deep work. I did my two things and you might have even gotten a couple of other small things done as well. One of the things you talk about is like, a, I think you call it post-mortem. Yes. Do you do this weekly or do you do this daily? So I do post-mortems anytime I've had a big milestone. Mm. So, and, and, and it can be, it can be different for, for, for some people, it, they can do it at different times, but ultimately I think post-mortems are most valuable when you've gone through something big and you've either had to use other people's language, a success or a failure. I don't like them because I'm always experimenting. So for me, I have an outcome. I've done an experiment and there's an outcome. And when I do a post-mortem, I'm really interested in disentangling. Was it me who caused the outcome? So did I drive the outcome or was it luck? And I think approaching this in life is really um, useful because one, it makes me much more resilient because I'm, I'm not tuned to failure. So I don't think that I failed in, in, in any moment. Two, when things go well, so when I have a good outcome, I'll know if it was my input. Equally, if things go badly, and it was my fault, it was my input, I'll know how to change the next time. And it also tunes you to luck as well. So, you know, when I started doing postmortems, I was just dividing things into inputs and luck. But now I'm disentangling luck into 
was it luck driven by somebody outside myself, which it often is actually who gets involved and manages to make sure um, that things actually go well? Or was it luck that um, was totally random that we could never, never control? You know, true that like before Christmas, I had so many, um, I had so many things on and I was really, really drowning. And I, and I was on, I was on this big project and one of my colleagues, Nikita, was on the project with me. And we had a really great outcome, but it was really because of 80% her hard work, 20% mine. And when I did my postmortem, I, I mean, I kind of knew it anyway. But when I did my postmortem, I really realized actually, had she not been a person who was inputting into it also, it wouldn't have been as good as as, as what it was. And, you know, that that means that I obviously kind of give thanks to her, which, 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 which I absolutely did. But it also shows that actually having other people involved can kind of help help kind of list projects when you're not able not able to do it so for my postmortems three things my input and then luck and luck is divided into other people and then randomness that 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 nobody can actually control i feel like having to go through that takes quite a lot of like guts because then it's revealing exactly where you are performing and where you're not and you have to be so truthful with yourself so I wonder yeah. if that holds people back as well, of not almost engaging with the fact that maybe something that they did or didn't do had an influence on that. It absolutely does. And I think it's a shame because for me, it allows me to figure out what I'm good at and what other people around me are better at than me. And once I've asked them and 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 I know that they actually like doing the thing that they're actually good at, it makes these amazing synergies. So in some ways, if you do it, it means that you'll be able to reveal firstly what you're bad at, but also is there somebody else, whether it's someone who's doing it now or someone who's outsourcing, you know, a lot of my social media, I outsource to people who are much better at, at, at it than me. And again, that's kind of a way of me working on the things that I'm actually, that I'm actually good at. So I, I, I absolutely agree with you. It stops people doing it, but I think what you should do it to the end of life is short. I'm going to figure out some things that I'm bad at, some things that I don't have time for, some things where other people are better than me. And then actually, maybe I don't do those things anymore. And I can really focus on where I have a comparative advantage. Something like this would be really useful to founders, especially when they're looking either for a co-founder or somebody on a very senior team where they have to figure out their strengths yeah. and also find complementary skills to them. And also be very, very clear as to not fall into what you call the similarity bias yes. of when you're hiring somebody into it just because they're very similar to you as opposed to somebody who complements your skills. So I see that being very, very useful. Yeah. And on the other side, I think for venture capitalists, it's very useful because they can figure out how mature the people who are pitching in front of them are in a world where we're kind of time poor by considering some of this stuff. So are they reflective? Do they have diverse advisors? Um, do they look like they future proof themselves in a way that they've diversified, not just kind of the, the the product that they're actually bringing to the market, but also the type of networks that they can actually draw on. So I think on both sides of the coin, behavioral science in the general sense, but also really thinking about the drivers of success um, can make, you know, venture capitalists and the people who they're, who they're supporting much more successful. On this topic of doing a postmortem, do you have a process or Anything you can share with our audience that they can go and do themselves? Yes, absolutely. So I think it's it's worth just having three columns in the simplest the simplest sense. So you have the first column, my inputs that led to the let led to the outcome. The second is luck, and you divide that into randomness. So you're 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 picking up all of the randomness, and the the other column is other people, and really just getting down the inputs that actually went into the process and how much you think um, swayed the outcome. And usually when you do postmortems, because as human beings, we're not so much with the details, you'll end up with four or five things on the on the page. So it's not that you're going to be overwhelmed with inputs and information. So, you know, kind of thinking about your time, what were the pivotal moments that allowed something to actually move towards a good outcome or towards a bad outcome? When you think about the choices that you made, did you bring the right people on board? And they just go into those three columns. And for me, that simple kind of sheet, which is which which is one that I that, that I have on my website that people can download. That simple sheet is one where it records you in the moment and allows you to do the reflection that we've been talking about, but also allows you to look back on your decision making over a long sequence of time and think about actually, do I always have the wrong people with me? Am I always leaving things too late? Am I always somebody who who's prone to procrastination? And allows you to address those faults that you that you come up with in yourself. In your book, you talk about what you call me plus which I love the title of it because it's like, you know, you and sort of 10% kind, yeah. um, kind of thing. Can you talk more about what 
you meant by that and what you want the readers to achieve by going through that process? Yeah, so I mean, the, the whole premise behind Thinking Big is really imagining who you'll be in a medium space of time. So it's quite far away. So it could be one year, two years, maybe even five years. Um, and originally, actually, the book was called The Five-Year Plan, which is which is, which is is kind of a funny story. But it's a so this, this kind of medium term perspective. And the idea behind that was twofold. So one, for you to really get a, this clear vision and the way the people who manifest do of what it is you want to be. So it's really kind of called up. You can imagine yourself actually doing the task the person is doing um, every single day. But the second, by doing that, by having this kind of vivid um, vivid imagery of who you're going to be over the medium term, it brings your future self forward, which is a really important concept in behavioral science. So in behavioral science, we know for sure that most people have what we call time and consistent preferences. So that means that they think that the person tomorrow is going to say no to the Big Mac, but the person today will have the Big Mac. The person tomorrow is going to have an early night, but the person today has a late night. So we really imagine ourselves being investors in the long run, both in the financial sense, but in, in ourselves, that we're going to be these really model citizens. But when it comes to the day, we tend to kind of renege on ourselves. And what bringing your future self forward does is it brings the costs and benefits and risk of that person into the modern day. And hopefully, and this has been shown to be true in research, allows you, because they feel quite vivid, make decisions that are, are good for them in the same way that you're making decisions for yourself in the present day. And, you know, as time goes on, I love the idea of having a me plus in AI. So you can actually see an avatar that's yourself in five years doing the tasks and what they had to do to get there. And I know that's been really successful for pensions. So I'm, I'm quite excited about that. But until now, I have to really kind of get people to use their imaginations or maybe journal a bit to put some um, to put some details into it. But ultimately, it's about that person coming into the room with you today in a way that you care about them like your friend, like your parent, like your child, and that you invest in them. Mm. It's like I related to some TikToks that sometimes come up on my feed where it says, what would be the richest, hottest, you know, most successful version of you do today? And sort of like keep that in your mind, which actually is yes, quite good. helpful because it like it forces you to think about, well, what do I actually you know, if I want to be all of those things, what yep. will I actually be doing in the here and now? Imagining that is really important. So I think where where manifestors get things wrong is that they just imagine themselves in the position, but not the hard work that gets there. Mm -hmm. And I think what you can do to really kind of draw the link is remember, because what we're trying to do is code that automatic habit brain. So it's showing up for the for the me plus is to really visualize what are the things that I need to do today? What are the habits that I need to do today to get me there? So you know, if you want to think, Maria, about who you're going to be in five years time, it's the habits that you have this week. So yeah. like people will always, we there's huge surveys in economics and sociology where they'll ask you, what did your parents do? What did you do in school? What did you like as a subject? None of that matters. If you give me what you're doing this week and you write down a time audit and you're really, really honest, that's the best predictor of who you're going to be mm. in five in five years time, that regular, that regular week audit. So those habits and, you know, at the end of each day, asking yourself, did I do something for that person in five years time is really important. And it's most important for people who are highly empathetic and who tend to give their time to others and to be really caring of family and friends, exactly the type of person that you want to be around on a day to day basis. But as individuals, they're very, very poor at investing in themselves in the same way that they invest in others. Yeah, it's like that question, like, what do you want? Yeah. And I feel like even when you're in this very senior positions, I mean, sometimes, you know, you know, CEOs of, you know, big brands come and they, you know, they can build a brand. Yep. But yet when it comes to themselves, it's like, well, who am I? What do I want? And that question is just so important. Yes. What I really enjoyed about your book is, and I was always saying to you earlier, I'm just like going through it and I'm just literally typing out all of the behavioral science insights which are highlighted and bold <laughs> and typing them out and like really going to like study those. So they're super helpful. But what of those insights would be helpful to somebody, say they're going for an interview for a new job or they're pitching for, um, you know, funds. So where they have to like sell themselves or present themselves, what can, you know, what insights can you share that will help to tip the odds in their favor? 
Well, I think if you can pay attention to the timing of when you actually present. So there's really good evidence that the timing of when you stand in front of someone or a group of people who are judging you really matters for the outcome. And that's raw luck usually, right? Because somebody outside your control does the rota and you just show up. And, you know, a really great example of this is the um, literature on judges in the United States that shows if you go in front of a judge just before lunch, you're much more likely to get a very long sentence. Yes. And judges, unlike venture capitalists, aren't open to bringing them sandwiches. So if you find yourself just before lunch making an effort to actually bring food, food can work as well to kind of help people open, uh, bring snacks and yeah, interview. to not be hungry. <laughs> well, yes, in, in, a, in a cute way, nice, you know, ni- ni- nice snacks as a gesture and say, I appreciate it's really close to lunch. These are kind of some things that helped me. So I thought I, w- I, I would share them is actually a, quite a good tip for somebody pitching, um, particularly in front of a panel that they don't know anybody on because mm. it makes you memorable for a good reason, but also it solves the problem of being hungry. But I think watching the timing is really important. So the kind of the evidence really suggests very strongly that first in the morning is where you should go or, or very first in the queue. If your pitch or if your interview, you know, you're going to knock it out of the park, you know, you're a shoe in for this role, that you actually have all of the credentials um, right at the end, if you're not so sure. So if you think actually this is, you know, a bit of a, a shoot and probably I'm not going to get it, but I'm putting my hat in the ring because the person who goes last is always the most memorable. Um, so for me, anytime I'm interviewing people, I like to randomly draw their interviews and give them a slot because, you know, I interview for behavioral scientists, so I don't want people playing on the biases that I already have in order in kind of in, in, in order to come into the room. And equally for people who are interviewing when I kind of teach inclusive leadership, I always say it shouldn't be the interview moment because I have this expression, which I which fundamentally is true. If you look at kind of the success of people chosen based on interviews, you may as well have a monkey throw a dart against the board as rely again on an interview. It doesn't give you any extra information, you know. So if you want to if you want to hire someone who's successful, focus on CV, focus on task based assessments. But that moment where you have that conversation and you see if you can gel as human beings, that's the moment where most of the error is actually actually come into the process. Oh, I'm going to want to explore this, but I want to follow my <laughs> early train of thought. But this is something I'd like to come back to and more particular because obviously for me personally, I'm yes. interested in interviewing, recruitment, how to improve my own process, but also how to help companies being able to avoid sort of the bias yeah. and also talking about sort of diversity. So I'd love to come back to that. Um, in terms of just going back to people maybe going you know, through a change of career and they thinking, well, do I stay or do I go? Like any tips for those people? I think do neither. So I think in today's economy, it's the cost of living crisis. The labor market is quite tight over, over a lot of jobs. Just going isn't the right thing to do, right? But equally, you don't want to stay in a job that isn't suiting you. So I'm a really big fan of preparing to exit. So where you start working today and you start carving time from your current job in order to set yourself up for success in the next one. So that includes, you know, um, honing skills, building networks. If you're in a company trying to build some opportunities within the same company in a different function, and if that's not possible, I'm a really big fan of the side hustles. So I think in today's economy, there's been a big shift in towards kind of gig economy, freelancing, contracting across such a range of occupations. I would be surprised that if you wanted to move jobs, that you wouldn't be able to find some opportunity to do some side hustling in order to build your reputation and earn income at the same time. So, all, you know, there's lots of books that claim that they're written to get people to quit their jobs. I would say Think Big is, is written to quit your job eventually. I think people really need to take kind of measured risks. You need to invest in yourself before you decide to step off that platform. Yeah, no, for sure. I think making just, you know, just like a, a snap judgment and saying, okay, I've had enough. Yeah, that's it. I'm leaving without having some sort of a plan makes no sense. But preparation is is the key. Any tips on how to be an effective recruiter when it comes to looking for the person that fits the bill for the role and how to avoid all of this unconscious and cognitive biases that you talk about in your book? Yes, I I think the first thing is, you know, for any job that we're filling, we tend to be more attracted to to the type of person who previously had that job in the past. And and for me, this is particularly interesting for women trying to get into sectors like technology and financial services, where in finance, we don't really have a huge um, share of women in the highest paid roles. And it's the same, it's same in tech. So always with that in mind, with diversity, I would say, you know, gather CVs and have a pile for the women and a pile for the men. 
and then pick the top five or whatever it is you want to shortlist to. And then that's your slate and you cross compare those groups basically. So really kind of thinking about moving away from representativeness heuristic, which is what we just kind of described. If I've seen people a lot in, in, in a sector, I'm much more likely to be attracted to them towards a meritocracy, which is ultimately what people want when they're hiring. I think in the general sense, if you really want a meritocracy, realizing that interviews aren't useful um, is, is is something that you really do need, need to take seriously. And I would focus on task-based assessments. So really thinking about what tasks can I give individuals in order to learn if they're capable of doing the things that I need them to do day to day in the job. So they hit the ground running. If you don't need, if you don't um, need them to hit the ground running, so you have kind of, you know, particularly this happens in for younger colleagues, you have training in the beginning. You might say, actually, all I want is some sensible people and I'm going to put them in and I'm going to give them, you know, four months of training and then they do a task-based assessment and then I decide who to keep on. And all of that moves us towards close to a meritocracy. If you really want to do an interview, doing an interview online, because we you know, lots of lots of places, even if they're not remote first, support hybrid working, where there's many more people on the panel who don't discuss with each other and who are different to each other, if it's a really important hire, is a really good way to leave it to what we call the wisdom of crowds, where if you have independent voters, you're likely to get closer to the truth. The problem in interviews comes where you have the same group of people and they're sitting around talking to each other. And because human beings are drawn to um, agreeing with each other, they tend to do a really bad job actually at discussing and and and, and figuring out outcomes that are complex. You won't get a really good discussion. Instead, you'll get one or two people dominating usually. And the, the having so many people there just becomes a checkbox exercise. So if I had my way, we would, we would just move away from interviews. I think an interview can be used once somebody's passed the task-based assessment. You're pretty sure you're going to hire them but maybe you need to convince them to come, you know? So it's kind of, uh, like if I think about me now, I probably wouldn't be so drawn to um, going, working for a place where I didn't get to meet the people beforehand. So if they offered me a job based on a task-based assessment, I would say, wait a minute, I also want to ask you some questions. And I think at that point, when you know that you are going to hire the person, investing time in meeting them and convincing them to come to your company is worthwhile. But I wouldn't be using it as a way to choose a colleague and I wouldn't mm-hmm. be putting overconfidence in kind of choosing a colleague. And in fact, when I interview, I like to have people on the panel with me who I leave. Let, re, I ask them to reveal who they think should get, get it first. I ask them to rank the candidates. And I don't think I've ever gone against um, what these independent people um, asked for, even when I disagreed, even when I disagreed, I kind of say, look, the interview is a moment of ego. I think we all think we're able to choose the best person and ultimately we can. So I'll leave those mistakes to other people <laughs> with me rather than myself. It's interesting you say that because I, I mean, I'm human and when you talk about this as well, it's like, you know, even though you know you have biases, sometimes you can think, well, I have, you know, you know, because I understand it and because I'm aware yeah. of it, I'm more aware of it than, you know, the next person next to me. And that's a dangerous place to be. But what I have noticed with, when I'm doing recruitment myself, and especially during COVID, when we're stepping away from meeting people face to face, and especially more on talking on the phone as opposed to a Zoom or some sort of a video screen, I feel like I'm more effective on the phone. And I was wondering whether it helps to reduce some of the biases because you're not seeing the person. I feel like when I have been making assessments, because that's what I'm supposed to be doing, I feel like I was more accurate in that. Any thoughts on that? It could be. I mean, I guess if you kind of think about what distorts outcomes, it is somebody's appearance. You know, um, I always kind of, uh, going back about four years ago, I had two talks to give in a day. One was in a very large American finance company um, that were actually over by Holborn, and the other was around here, around Islington, in a big tech company. And I actually remember being in a hurry and changing in the back of a taxi from the the kind of the black polished suit into something that was much more casual in order to go to the other venue. And I thought about that a lot that night, and I've thought about it a lot since. We we really are obsessed with how people look, um, and do they fit the role based on their kind of on their dress? And that's where a lot of biases can actually come from. So if you imagine kind of representative as heuristic is do I have the right gender, for example, to be in a role? It also has, do I have the right dress 
style, which gets very complicated when you're somebody who could be really talented to work in a big finance or a big tech and they expect you to work differently in in both, basically. And, you know, you can go to some of the tech companies around here and people will be in jeans and shirts who might prefer to be dressed in a different way. And you can go to finance and it's got a bit better since COVID, but in some of the kind of the, the big investment banks, still people look very much in the kind of three piece type type suit that you you would wear. And again, that's a bias. We shouldn't be hiring people based on what they wear. And it can sound trivial, but there's lots of folk who will say that because they have to dress in a way that doesn't make them feel comfortable, they don't feel comfortable at work. So it really does bring issues for diverse talent within within the, the walls of companies um, who do identify with the way that they dress. So I think if you're somebody like me where you're not your 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 identity isn't part of how you dress. My identity is held in, in in other things. It's okay, but I think if you are somebody who likes to dress in a particular way in a particular style and being asked to do something different in a company for no good reason, that is actually problematic. Hmm. What if you work in people facing fashion business, where part of what you look like also potentially determines the kind of relationships that you would have with the you know staff or potential clients any thoughts on that i mean i think this is a, an extreme example of a perpetual um problem so you know let's imagine that we met a designer today who the only thing that they liked to wear was a white t-shirt and, and and jeans with no branding but they were the most epic designers so if they never met anyone and those designs were put out on the internet for sale everyone would agree that they were the most epic designer i agree with you when they hit the fashion circuit if they had to talk to people to convince them to buy their designs, they're probably going to be met with resistance because they're not dressed the right way. But yet what we need them to do, they're doing to an excellent, an excellent standard. And, you know, it's the same if we think about somebody who is working in Google, who wants to dress like they're working in an investment bank or someone in an investment bank who wants to dress like they're working in Google. If fundamentally the product that they're creating and their added value is excellent, um, has a level of excellence that we don't otherwise have, I believe that's what a meritocracy is. Mm -hmm. But I think as human beings, we have this kind of social kind of, you know, social animal to us where we really want to include and exclude people based on whether they conform to rules that are really nonsense and are just made up by sectors. Right. Yeah. And that's problematic. And I think people might be listening and say, well, you know, for the creative designer, they should play the game. They're getting played a lot. That, you know, you can go down that road. But where do you actually draw the line? Because there are people who would be much happier in their career if they had a freedom ex of expression in, you know, how they wear their hair, the type of dresses that they actually wear. Um, and ultimately, what the fashion rules are don't necessarily matter for the f for the product. So for me, we should be looking at the product, not how the individual is presenting themselves. I'm totally with you. And I've had some really horror stories with clients where they would just simply not even consider an excellent candidate because they were wearing the wrong hair clip or, yeah. or you know something so trivial but for them the aesthetic and the look was almost more important than the skills this person would bring into the work and for that exact reason it was extremely difficult to find anybody because yeah. the, it just narrows down your pool so much and but, we and we uh, sorry to remember, we see this in wage data where in some countries if you're self-reported as being more attractive you earn less mm -hmm. in some countries if you're self-reported as being more attractive you earn more but again this is something that really shouldn't be determining the wage rate because beauty shouldn't pay right it's it, 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 it's something about us but it, unless you're a fashion model perhaps it's something about us that doesn't necessarily kind of add uh, kind of add value and even now within fashion the models are being chosen to have a much diverse kind of range of looks and characteristics which i really approve of because ultimately the customer are diverse and they have lots of different lo lots of different characteristics. So I see us kind of trying to decouple these things, which I think is wonderful, but the progress is pretty slow. Yeah, no, for sure. I'll come back to diversity in a moment, but one of the things I was reading about you is that you have created an index to predict profit and loss of a company based on its culture. Yeah. So can you talk about your insights from that? I should say we're creating it. It's still very much in flow. So this is a, a joint project between um, my centre at the LSE, the Inclusion Initiative, and City, um, the, the 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 investment bank. And what we're really trying to do is take 
scrape lots of data from the internet that really inve- uh, that, that represents employee sentiment, news, Twitter feeds, company hierarchies, and look to see if we have a signal that we can give to investors in how it links to two things really, kind of innovation. So these kind of early markers of whether or not a company is going to be successful and also um, these kind of profit and earnings calls. So we're in it. It's tough because obviously, you know, inclusion and culture are these kind of latent concepts that are very, very hard to measure. And the data can be noisy at times, but it seems it is going in the right direction. So I'm really excited about it. Um, If we're finished, it's kind of two, when we're finished, it's kind of two things that I'm hoping, or three, that might come out of it. So the first is that it's given to kind of desks who who essentially bet on companies, but usually the language is more sophisticated than that, but they'll choose a company that they're going to to invest in for a long run. And not because they it, it's for social responsibility measures, although that that's part of it, but because it's actually good for business, they're going to choose that company. The second is it could be an index. So people like me and you, when we're investing in our pensions, the companies that have higher cultures are more likely to get picked up as compared to the companies that are low cultures. And the third is that it could be a kite mark. So, you know, in the same way that somebody is choosing to buy something because it's more environmentally friendly, which lots of people do these days, they even will pay a premium for that. We can give information on the companies that are much more socially responsible when it comes to um, inclusion. Mm -hmm. And again, they can um, make that choice because they actually care about other individuals, but also saying, actually, this is a company that not only has kind of a good ethos with respect to its people, but it also has a good ethos with respect to business. And that's why, for me, the link between inclusion and profits is is so important. I think lots of people don't believe it's there. And I think theoretically it is. So to be able to offer uh, proof um, of that through data that the firm don't even have to supply has been very attractive to me. So is there proof now or is that what you are working on to assess? That's what we're working on. So at the moment... If you're somebody who believes diversity is good for business, you'll find loads of evidence that diversity is good for business. If you're somebody who believes diversity isn't good for business, there's lots of studies there. If you believe there's no link, there's lots of studies there. And the reason I think, and this is essentially what we're trying trying to offer better evidence for, but kind of the early evidence I have suggests this, is that all those studies might be right, diversity only works when you have inclusion. So if you bring diverse people into businesses and you don't have inclusion, uh, one of a few things might happen. So the first is they might leave because they don't feel comfortable because no one's listening to them. The second is they might conform. And this happens a lot, particularly, you know, I, I've, I've spent a lot of time kind of interviewing successful women and very often they will have conformed for a part of their career in order to get ahead. So just kind of, even though they would choose to say something that would be quite different, they would vote with the group, for example. Um, or you can have dissent where the person who's diverse just really wants to be heard and they end up in lots of arguments and nobody's listening. And that helps explain why we get this kind of null or negative effect. But when you add inclusion, when you add somebody who's there, who cares about people being diverse around the table, not because they want to take a picture, not because they think it's socially responsible, but because they really believe those people give them an edge, mm-hmm. that's when it translates into profits. Without that belief in the leader, and without an inclusive leadership style, diversity is not good for business. So if you're the leader and you really believe that, you know, diversity is a lot of BS and that it's just something that your company is doing as a, as a box ticking exercise, you're going to be much more likely to exclude diverse voices who disagree with you. If you're somebody who believes it's true, your ears are going to be open and you're going to be actively listening for that next great outlier idea. So, you know, economists, I kind of said in the beginning, economists think about costs, benefits and risks, but really the decisions that we make on a day-to-day basis are about our beliefs about costs, Mm -hmm. our beliefs about benefits, our beliefs about risk, and they might not necessarily be accurate. Mm. You're the founder of the Inclusion Initiative. Can you talk about what that is and what you're doing there? I mean, obviously this must be part of that. Yes. So the Index is one of the big uh, projects under the Inclusion Initiative, which I set up at the London School of Economics in November 2020. Um, And the idea really was to demonstrate that inclusion is good for business, to give company tools to help them become much more inclusive. And the last part, which is really, really important, is to give company tools to evaluate whether or not the changes that they're making are working. And that third bit is so important because companies spend thousands and thousands of pounds weekly on diversity and inclusion initiatives and the progress has been dismally slow. 
So there is no other part of a company that is for profit where you would spend so much money on something and not care about the return on investment. And I really care about the return on investment. So I like the idea that, you know, we have knowledge over things that might work, but maybe in some contexts they do work, maybe in some contexts they don't work. So it's really important then to evaluate them. And if you buy into the evaluation, it will allow you, one, figure out whether or not what you chose to do worked. And you have to be really objective in this and not like have your ego wrapped up in having a good outcome. But the second is it allows you to stop doing things that aren't working and double down on the things that are working, which again allows DI move move a little bit faster. So mm. for, for us, I think at the Inclusion Initiative... I, I love data. We've started doing even um, we've even started doing kind of these large qualitative studies to figure out other things that we can do beyond what's already in the literature. But that evaluation bit is so important. Mm. So say you are a very large organization and, you know, the HR directors are really, you know, the leaders are well on board. They want to make it happen. What advice can you give to them when it comes to recruiting at all of the levels through the organization? So I think the first thing is take people out of the process as much as you can, right? Okay. So task-based assessments that are ideally corrected by AI. So, so, you know, people aren't necessarily giving the judgment. If the answers aren't objective, then task-based assessments that are blinded. So I don't know whether it's a man or a woman and I don't see their name and I can't think about whether or not they're high socioeconomics status or low socioeconomic status. Um, so on the one hand, take human beings out of the process as much as you can. Um, on the second bit, really pay attention to the diversity on the slates that are actually going through. So really push recruiters to provide slates that really are diverse and don't take this response. Well, there isn't that many of person type X on the market. Just say, well, if there isn't, I'll find a recruiter who will give me that kind of person type X. And I think those two things can really help regardless of where you are, you are in the cycle. I think things that you're trying to do, like blinding CVs, for example, be really careful. So the kind, the kind of old cures don't really work so well. So blinding CVs works quite well at the early cycle. As you get more mature and, and the position gets more senior, we rely a lot on cover letters. And as soon as the cover letter is entered into the mix, then removing, blinding the name doesn't really matter. You know, certain types of people in our society tend to be much more confident, overconfident in writing about their accolades as compared to others. And you don't want that to sway. You don't want that to sway the outcome. So I'm a big fan of AI. Um, I've written on AI and, you know, I know people complain that AI is biased and it is, but actually the evidence suggests it's less biased than human beings. So mm. if I could change the headline, it wouldn't be AI is biased, it would be AI is biased, but it's less biased than, right. than human beings. Um, and ultimately really take seriously who gets to be on the panel, you know. So the problem, of course, with the interview being the last decision is that even if the process is done perfectly well and, you know, you use recruiters who give you slates and you do task-based assessments, if you're still having your last stop as an interview and if you're in a place where culture isn't particularly good, you set it up for the system to be gamed where, you know, five people will sit around who know each other quite well and they'll all vote in the same direction. So mm -hmm. that that last stop of the interview, moving that out as much as possible, I think is really is really important. Mm. Not good news for me as a, <laughs> a human <laughs> recruiter that kind of sits even outside of the organization. But on the on the point about AI being less biased. I mean, what do you think about, I mean, obviously, you know, if you're looking at a CV and I don't know, you put in the, if you want somebody to have gone to an amazing university. I mean, one of the things it's like, well, some minorities or, you know, underprivileged yeah. individuals, well, they don't even get the chance to do that. So how can you circumvent that on using AI and looking through CVs? Well, I think if you want someone to have gone to an amazing university, you don't really care that much about diversity and inclusion, right? I think that's kind of the starting point. So I think you might care about kind of getting somebody quickly and, and, and that's probably a good way to get someone quickly, but you don't care so much about diversity and inclusion. And I think this is why I like task-based assessments, you know, for companies who have widened out to task-based assessments and allow people, and this actually is, there is this big role for recruiters in this, right? They have to find people to actually do the task-based assessments. But for people who widened it out, they found that individuals have self-trained, you know, particularly in things where 
the content that's needed is high in maths, for example. So like in 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 kind of pricing derivatives in financial companies or high in programming, where it's not easy to self-train yourself. But if you if you focus on it, you can self-train yourself with the resources that are out there. You can then get hires who never went to university. And I think I think that's a good thing. You know, I saw um Josh Graff, who's really senior in LinkedIn, post something, and I didn't realize he hadn't gone to university, but he actually was saying, you know, it really gets to my nerves when we um Overfocus on individuals going to university because if we if we if if LinkedIn had done that I wouldn't have had I wouldn't have this job and, and and I think that's actually something to really kind of think about. Some of the most successful people in our society didn't go to university, um, and we probably have lots of people with this high success potential who aren't getting to kind of realize that potential because in the we're we're stuck on what university did you go to. Um, what grade did you get in university? And ultimately, do I like you in the interview? And those three things aren't going to kind of get you diversity and inclusion. But I'd also be willing to bet it doesn't get you the highest the highest um, talent either. Mm. So conversely, if you're a candidate and you're putting together your CV with a view to it being somehow screened by AI, what should you be thinking about in order to increase your chances of being selected for the jobs that are close to your skills and experience and yeah desires so the big companies that are you trying to kind of adopt ai in a way that's fair are linking the algorithms to the job criteria so you really just need to look at the job criteria and make sure that your cv makes it easy for a machine to see that you actually satisfy those criteria and i think that's a full stop i think when firms are asking for things that aren't in the job description it becomes a really unfair game because you don't necessarily know um you don't necessarily know for example what they're asking for so it's very very hard to tailor your cv i think the problem is people who lie on their cvs now because they know that they're going to get screened from ai which is actually an which is an emerging problem that there isn't so much of a solution for will ultimately make people fall back on what university did you go to can you show me a degree cert where those barriers to entries are really really kind of clear you know you can you, if, if you went to the LSE we can get you a certificate to say how you got on your your exams in a really really short period of time and I think if you're if that's your worry then you're back in the loop of task-based assessments again so rather than falling back on the priors of saying okay this isn't working I'm just going to rely on the type of university that they went to push yourself to say no I still want to have diversity and inclusion people are gaming the system so there's two things they need to do give me the cv that uh, um, satisfies the criteria and also do these task based assessments i'd like to talk about a topic that's very close to my heart which is women in senior leadership positions and i know that you share that yes and my question to you is like what stops women from getting those senior leadership positions i mean i think the biggest thing that stops women is that a lot of times when you have the conversation about women being in the most senior roles in society, that people start talking about, we have to grow the pipeline. And straight away, they lose me in that discussion because the pipeline has been coming now quite steadily for a while and we're still losing women within the middle. So something is really, really fundamentally going wrong. I think if you buy a narrative that there aren't women talents, you know, um, who can do particular jobs in society or if you buy a narrative that, that women don't want these jobs, then y- your belief in that as somebody who might be a gatekeeper in, a, in an organization can actually drive up the barriers that keep women out of positions that, that are really, really senior. So I think there's a lot of work to be done on the narrative that's around women. You know, I often hear we don't have talent. We do. There's lots of talent. I, I, I sit in London. I meet incredible women all the time who are very capable of kind of, you know, um, being in, in these most senior positions. So in some ways, it, the first thing that we really need to look at are the stories that we tell about women in society, that there's not talent in particular areas, that they don't want particular jobs, and fundamentally that we, because of that, we need to focus on this kind of early, early pipeline. I say that for two reasons. One, it's not a route to progress because we have for a long time lost women in the middle, as I've already said. But two, I think that push really leads to these very weird hierarchies where you have lots of women who are junior at the bottom and lots of very, very senior men at the top, which, you know, I I find very weird. I think, you know, even within organizations, abstracting from kind of the values of diversity at the top, that kind of power structure doesn't set us up for an equal society in the future. So 
for me, I'd love to see a real kind of focus on two of the sectors that I care about, finance and tech. And within those, big tech really taking seriously having um, equal representation of women in the executive position. So I'm talking CFO, COO, CEO. Um, and also within finance, um, investment banking, really pushing for progress and private equity. I think those particular sectors, if we get those big tech, private equity, investment banking, particularly investment bankers and um, uh, private equity, they hold a lot of the money that allows entrepreneurs scale up and entrepreneurs move forward. That then will have this trickle down into society to kind of entrepreneurs, founders, younger people that we're never going to get if we just look at the if we if we just look at this pipeline. Hmm. I never looked at it that way. That's really interesting. And you're so right, because it's almost, you know, if you're going to look for any kind of a shortcut, this must be it. Because if they can be more representation there, then as you said, it trickles down. Yeah. Talking about also biases, I mean, you're talking about, well, you know, the stories that we tell ourselves about, well, women don't want these jobs or women, there's not enough talent, um, female talent in this. Can the reverse be true as well? Because I'm looking at myself, I'm talking to my peers and also as a headhunter who has been in the business for 17 years and looked at the numbers of people or numbers of women who are in predominantly female-led roles. So for example, in fashion, like, you know, buying and merchandising, predominantly female roles. And then when they reach a certain level, which is, tends to be sort of the senior manager, at least one third of them is on maternity leave mm -hmm. at any one point. And when I look at that, I mean, this is data, but then when I have conversations with my peers saying, well, you know, I can't talk about the fact that I've had a miscarriage or the fact that I'm trying for a baby or I'm talking about the the question that mom's like, well, how are you going to be, you know, doing this job and also um, carrying on with being a mother? And can the reverse be true in terms of looking at these stories and creating a picture, for example, in my head? Because that's my opinion as to what really holds women back is there is this huge inequality when it comes to parenting and motherhood. And there is the motherhood penalty where, you know, your wages are docked, uh, not docked on purpose, but overall because you take time out of the uh, the workforce and you're also seen as somebody, well, how can you do both jobs at the same time? So my question is, can the converse be true? What's your opinion on that? So I think you're right. I mean, the motherhood penalty is alive and kicking. It's about a third of the wage gap between men and women can be explained by these kind of transitions out of the workforce. I think the first thing is that when we talk about the motherhood penalty, we always imagine it's because mom is at home looking after the kid and they take this time out. And I don't think that's true. So I think that's some of it. Yes, if you take some time out of the labor force, it, it is probably going to happen that you're going to have some gaps in pay. So if you have a peer, for example, who started and they're not taking time out, they're probably going to be, you know, whatever it is, nine months, a year ahead of you, depending on the length of maternity leave. But I think we can't discount that women are treated differently from the moment that they announce that they're pregnant and then also when they come back. So if before you off board... You know, if you're in sales, for example, you're getting less clients. If you're somebody in marketing, you're getting a kind of a, a, a worse portfolio of things to, to work on. And if you come back and you don't transition back into the same position that you're in, you're going to be hold, held up much longer. So it's important to realize that the two of the things happen. There's the woman herself taking time out, which you might say, OK, that is a, a legitimate time out for her to take. But the second is the beliefs of people who work with her that she's just not necessarily able for kind of coming back also holds her back. And, you know, a few years ago, now about four years ago, I met a woman who her husband actually had decided he was going to be the primary carer of the kids. So she wanted to come back after a month and she was treated terribly when she came back. I mean, she was, you know, someone who was really top of her game. Her clients were taken away from her. She really had to scrap in order to get back. And this wasn't somebody who wanted to take a traditional maternity leave. I think the second type of the coin, which is something that you've hit on is, it's wrong that women are seen as the primary caregiver automatically. Um, and people will argue this is down to women's preferences. And I'm sure there are some women who do want to be at home for their kids for one, two, three years. But equally, I'm sure there's more men than we actually know about who would who would like to do that. And they don't necessarily um, get the opportunity. But I think ultimately, 
unless companies take seriously their role in the incentives that they're giving on parental leave and what that can actually do to men and women, you're not going to see the type of progress that we might want. So when you when you spoke, you know, you said, okay, people would wonder, can I do it all? Or, or can that woman do it all? Because she's doing two things. But what if men and women take maternity and paternity leave in equal measure? Do we start worrying about that with all of the men who take it? Or do we kind of eradicate it and say, look, this is just something in life that happens to a lot of couples. They have babies, they take time off. And actually as a company, because we know that careers are long, we're going to smooth that out. And I prefer that story. I prefer a story where you go into the labor force now when you're in your 20s, early 20s, people are working till they're 70 plus now, an extraordinary long period of time. We're trying to now, you know, in the latest budget here in the UK, we're trying to push people back into the, in the hunt budget, we're trying to push people who are over 50 back into the labor force. We want people to work for longer. During that time, lots of things that are going to happen. For men and women, they will have children and they want to take time out. We want our men to take time out equally as compared to the women. Um, And I think that will help the gender pay gap, which I explain in in a minute. But other things are going to happen. Somebody might burn out and they want to take a year off. They want to take a sabbatical. Somebody might get cancer and they want to take a year off. They want to prioritize their health. Somebody might suffer a bereavement and it really knocks them into a depression and they want to take a year off because they want to kind of refine find themselves again. And I think in these long careers, companies should be enabling people to do that. And I think if we focus particularly on the men and women taking paternity leave in equal measures, couples who are making a decision about whether mum or dad should be the one to stay at home and look after the kids for six, seven months, eight months, nine months when they're young, can rationally say it makes sense for the woman to do that job. Not because she gave birth, not because she's the most nurturing, but because she's probably earning the less because of the gender pay gap. Mm -hmm. So couples who make an economic decision, which a lot of them do, will say, we now have an extra person to feed. We need to think smart about our money. Childcare is expensive. Mum should stay at home. And I think if you have men and women entering the labor force and in equal numbers, we expect them to go on maternity leave or parental leave in the future, then the gender pay gap starts to close because you don't get that penalty ever before you're announcing you're announcing that you're having a child. So the belief around what maternity means drives these gender gaps, I would think to a greater extent than the actions of the woman herself. Mm-hmm. And I think firms, particularly the largest firms in our society, have a huge role to play in rewir- rewiring society to say, actually, Dad wants to stay home. That's awesome. You know, it's really awesome and 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 good for dad. Mum wants to stay home. That's also for mum. Both want to stay home. That's good. It's amazing that they can afford that. We're happy for them. And that time off is facilitated. Mm. It's quite hard though, because when we're talking about, you know, having our own human biases and having most men in senior positions who may not, you know, who are growing up with these stories and all of a sudden yeah. having to see a different side of it. Like, how do we address that? Like how you know, if we, it's almost like a catch-22. There's not enough senior women to be able to say, well, hold on a second. <laughs> this is not, you know, this is not working. And as you said, it's like, if you can't see it, you can't be it. You need to see the representation. But it's it's having to educate very senior people who have those stories in their heads. Like, how do we tackle that? That's a big and, question. <laughs> and do they want to be educated? I think that's kind of part of the, you know, part of it is I often meet people where they kind of say like, our company is doing okay. We don't really need to focus on women or diversity and inclusion. We're doing okay. I think ultimately there's two things. So always you want to have culture change where you change minds. Um, some people's minds just won't be changed. And for that, we rely on policy. So, you know, we think about quotas. I'm a fan of quotas as a blunt instrument. It's not perfect, but it does bring us progress. Um, supply chain management, you know, I've been really known to, in some of the big companies that I'm involved with to push for supply chain management where they're asking the people who they're investing in, they're asking the people who are their suppliers to make sure that they are actually changing how women are treated within the company and also underrepresented talent in general. So I think there's some people who will spend their lives having conversations and trying to change the minds of one or two people. I'm not one of those people. I've I've met a number of individuals who I'm convinced whose minds would never change. And if they do change, it won't be me. It would be a big push from society, a big push from a policymaker that will actually kind of get them get get them to do it. And that's why who are in the senior positions becomes really important. You know, in the absence of having a woman in a senior position, 
we want to have inclusive leaders. So, and we've seen some of these, right? So you've seen Barack Obama, for example, who was an amazing inclusive leader in in the US and really kind of pushed for progression along some of the things that now his legacy um, are, are so important, like, like the health the healthcare bill that, the bill that he passed. So it doesn't always need to be a woman at the top of the pyramid. Um, it makes me happy if we have 50-50, but I think if we're having a slow walk, what will speed us up is having more inclusive leaders at the top. So how can we do that? So really paying attention in recruitment to how inclusive an individual is at the senior level, not because of what they say, because today in today's society, when you get to the top of an organization, you would be pretty good at BSing about diversity and inclusion, right? So virtue signaling um, will be something that is kind of really, really innate to you. And you mightn't even realize that you're doing it, but looking back and saying, who did this person bring along in the organization? So who was the pipeline of talent that they nurtured? And can you show me um, people who have don't have the same ethnicity as you, don't have the same background as you in socioeconomic status, don't have the same gender as you, who you have nurtured on your career and they're now in managing director positions or equivalent? And really focusing on that, because if someone has a history of nurturing diverse talent, when they get that seat in the executive table, that's what they're going to do. They're going to make they're going to be asking the questions and making sure, OK, we're making this policy. Um, how can it backfire for our underrepresented talent? We're making this policy. How can we make sure that we include more voices from underrepresented talent? We've just made a big decision. Who were the people who fed into it? Oh, well, that doesn't sound right to me. Why weren't more people who who are underrepresented in our, our, our organization canvas? I feel we only have one view and really kind of pushing that type of leadership. Mm. What does leadership mean to you? Well, I think anyone can be a leader. I actually, I, I, I do a lot of like exec, exec education on um, inclusive leadership, but it's in, it's funny. Some uh, people asked me recently, they were like, well, we'd love to, you to come, but we want you to talk to people who don't have um, direct reports, who don't have line management. And I hate the word line management. It's really, it really grates my nerves. And I was saying, you know, you know, a leader is somebody who influences people. So you don't need to be line managing them. You know, and, you know, yeah, given the exactly. Team. Mm. So for me, a leader is somebody who is followed by other individuals. Um, there's there are people who, when they you know stand up in the theatre, everybody stands up and gives a standing ovation because they're they're somebody who's being watched. And then the question for me is, is a person kind of a good leader or inclusive leader, or are they kind of a negative leader or command and control type leader? And we know somebody is an inclusive leader by just looking at the type of people who are interested in their work. Are they all genders? Are they all ethnicities? Are they all socioeconomic backgrounds? Are they influencing people from all walks of life? Because in the end, it's very easy to convince your friends and your network to follow you, particularly if you actually have access to jobs and you can and you can pay them. It's not that easy to to get people to follow you, one, when you don't have access to jobs, but two, when you... Um, are, are kind of saying things that will force them into conformity. So I'm always the most impressed when I see folk who are giving positive messages that really kind of center around inclusivity and the people who are listening to them are diverse themselves because then you know in the spirit of the wisdom of crowds that what that person is saying makes sense, that they're not a virtue signaler, that there's somebody who really is walking the talk. Mm, I have so many questions for you and I'm really interested and supportive of the work that you're doing and I would love to you know find out what the results are of the profit and loss of companies based on their culture so I wish you all the very best with that and, um, where can people find you yeah so if people want to learn more um go to www.gracelorden.com which will be in the show notes yes um and also um if you want to check out my book think big I would be really appreciative I'm a fr it's my first book so as a first time author anybody who buys it is like family to me yeah and leave an Amazon <laughs> review as well um, yes leave an Amazon review I'm really bad at I'm really bad at sales I, I do wish someone from Penguin who's here to <laughs> yes please do leave an Amazon yeah. review. well I can highly recommend it so yeah go ahead and um you know get your copy because it was really really interesting and very practical amazing and Grace thank you so much thank you so much it's been a pleasure thank you so much for joining me here on Anatomy of a Leader. What were your takeaways? And if you haven't already, I'd love for you to subscribe and follow this podcast. And I'll see you in the next episode.